Hello and welcome to this week's bonus episode of Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. This week, I spoke with Robbie Watt, who is a lecturer at Manchester University. He teaches on a range of courses, including the politics of climate change. And he joined me to discuss his research into carbon offsetting markets, uh, the fantasy of how this market in particular will solve climate change drawing on psychoanalytic theory of Lacan to explain how ideology and subjectivity are essentially impeding our ability to collectively respond to the climate crisis. This is great. This is uh, one of those philosophical conversations, chats that I really, really love. I highly suggest you check out the episode. I think it was brilliant to see um, psychoanalytic and philosophical theory applied to a real world problem, a real world framework, such as the carbon credit market, which If anyone has been listening to this podcast for some time or is following my journalism, uh, I lambast every single opportunity. It seems obscene to me to use the very frameworks of capitalism that are causing the problem to try and solve the problem. The thing I want to touch on in this bonus video is an idea that uh, Robbie suggests actually towards the end, which is the repoliticization of spaces. And what he means by that is when, for example, uh, on a local governance level, uh, people come together to work on a legislative framework or a policy or whatever, um, and there's different stakeholders, we have to understand that they will have different objectives, different outcomes, and different desires. And to pretend that different groups of people with different desires are coming together to work collaboratively on a piece of legislation or a policy or a project is depoliticizing the space. He says that part of the way of like combating ideology and understanding better our own subjectivity is repoliticizing these spaces, acknowledging the fact that people have different outcomes, acknowledging that there is an agenda, that there are different intentions, that the only way to work with the powerful is to understand that that the powerful have a different desired outcome than you. This ties in very nicely with the episode I did with Catherine Stewart uh, called Pro Power, How the Far Right Stole America. She's an investigative reporter that has spent the past 12 years tracking the rise of the new right and how they weaponized abortion to create a multi-denominational grassroots support network and claw power back from the progressive agenda. Part of what Catherine noticed is how the powerful set the framework for debates, Um, that they will couch a debate in terms of a binary that suits them, which hides their agenda. What I mean by this um, is abortion, the abortion debate. I don't even like using that language. Um, It will be seen as pro-choice versus pro-life, whereas in actuality, it is a an agenda point that has been weaponized by a small group of people who wish to impose their Christian fascist ideals on an incredibly diverse nation. Forgetting their intention or not working hard enough to uncover the agenda of the people that are setting debates is where we fall prey to kind of our own ideology. Perhaps it's because it's such a terrifying thing to think that there are people that wield such power in the world and would like to use it to impose their vision upon the world. And for disempowered people, um, who typically, arguably, therefore, are more ingrained in their uh, communities and definitely probably have a different value system to the powerful, it is very scary to think that people like that exist. And not in the conspiracy, you know, lizard-wearing whatever way, um, but just the fact that there are people who will continuously put their own benefit above anybody else's and will actually happily sacrifice the unknown and unknowable hundreds or thousands or millions of people in order to get what they want. That's exploitation. We have historical precedent for it. We have current precedent for it, but it's still a terrifying thing. And so perhaps we allow for certain debates to become weaponized and to become couched in ideological terms because then we have a sense of agency over what we're discussing, right? Let's continue with the um, Roe v. Wade example. Uh, If you couch it in pro-life, pro-choice terms, um, then anybody can get involved in that debate because you will fall on one side of the argument 
And you can have a, an emotional discussion, you can have an intellectual discussion, a dispassionate one, um, an evidence-based one. You know, people can actually get involved in the discussion. Whereas if you say, this is a point that has been deliberately manipulated and weaponized by a very small group of people so that they can manipulate uh, large swaths of the population into supporting their bid for power without realizing it. Um, Gosh, I mean, how do you begin to engage with that? How do you begin to engage with the powerful? Part of their power is how powerful they seem, their untouchability, their separateness. Staring into the eyes of the powerful is like staring down the barrel of the gun. What can you do? You can come up against such power. You can point at it and name it and still... There is nothing that you as an individual can do. And that is where collective action becomes so important. And it is why the powerful want to continue atomizing debates and continue with capitalism, which individualizes people to such an extent they forget that they have the power as a collective, not perhaps a power that is as powerful, but still a power base from which to act. I really love Robbie's language repoliticizing certain spaces because even that gives agency saying that we refuse to engage with a debate in a certain way we refuse your framework we refuse even your negotiations for pay we're going on strike you know i love this idea that that repoliticizes because that gives a sense of empowerment it gives a sense of agency it gives a sense of joining in the political debate beyond ideology Ideology is a very easy space to exist in because you are never wrong when you're ideological and the other person is never right when they are ideological. It is fairly intellectually lazy, actually. Um, and I certainly have been guilty of existing in purely ideological spaces. Um, just good fun, really. But political spaces, spaces where action can be taken, where results are tangible, where you need evidence, where you need to work together. These are all things that we can aim towards and we must aim towards. We must see the repoliticization of these discussions and these spaces as a way of taking agency and empowerment and autonomy over the direction that the world is going in, rather than falling prey to ideological weaponization which neuters us from action and neuters us from collectivity, from collective action. The other really interesting thing that Robbie brought up in his research is this idea that you can agree with someone about the intention. You can agree with somebody on the need to take action, but disagree with the ideology that they use to take action. So for example, people working in the carbon offsetting market, um, many of them, uh, especially those who are like building the frameworks, they, these people are green. Their heart is in the right place. Their intention is to make the world a better place. But because they are using the paradigm of the economic market, capitalism, and furthering that paradigm, and someone like me will disagree that the market is a way in which we can solve these problems, that, those are ideological perspectives, essentially, even though we both agree on the need for action. And whilst an argument does need to be had over the ideology and why certain people think that way, um, why we do succumb to forces of capitalism, the forces of our environment, the forces of where we come from, nonetheless, to get stuck on that ideological debate is to miss the very opportunity to work with people who have the same intention as you, which is to do the right thing. Perhaps the most effective way, therefore, would be rather than suggesting to people your, um, your ideology is wrong, they say, here's a different method that works really well. Would you like to come and work with us on this thing? Um, so, for example, uh, hammering home the fact that environmental regulations have a really effective track record at regulating the environment and regulating the market, um, and that market-based solutions have a really bad track record. You don't need to get into an ideological debate about whether or not capitalism is the best thing for mankind and the best thing for the planet. You just have to look at evidence of the methods that we use. And then anyone who shares an intention with you will probably be more amenable to a conversation. 
And anybody that is weaponizing ideology for a different intention will be revealed in that moment. Zizek talks a lot about this uh, ideology and why it's so powerful, potent. It's because we identify with our ideologies. And again, with a disempowered population, the one thing that we can hold on to and create are our opinions, especially if we feel that we are unable to take action in the way that we would like. I personally think that that's a huge reason that the culture wars are so prevalent in today's society. Um, it's very understandable for a disempowered and tired generation of young leftists to reach for low-hanging fruit, which is ideological debate. And it's still important debate. But if we do identify with our ideologies, if that is a truth, a fact, if that is where our subjectivities come from, then you cannot just attack the ideology of another. You need to give them a secondary ideology up upon which they can hold to like a lifeboat as you articulate why their current one might be incorrect. Because if you just attack somebody's ideology without giving them something else to hold on to, then you're essentially telling them that their very self, their notion of self is incorrect. That's not going to make you friends. It also creates wars. If we continue with the carbon offset example, if you could give people another ideology, which is that they relate more to the part that wants to do right by the world than the part that really believes markets are the way to do that, then again, you are likely to have a much more fruitful discussion and collaboration. Perhaps that's something we need to do. Perhaps we need to start thinking about how to provide other people with identities before we start attacking the ideologies upon which they roost. I don't know, but that's enough for me today. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope that this was valuable to you in some way. If you're new here, remember to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Uh, if you're a fan of the show, if you've been listening to it for some time, support the channel on Patreon or at planetcritical.com. It is very much the support of the Planet Critical community that makes all of this possible. So a huge thank you to everyone who is supporting the show. Thanks to everyone else who is sharing the show. I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you next week.